My guest on Future Cities Africa today is Lisa Reynolds. She's the Chief Executive Officer of the Green Building Council of South Africa. Lisa, welcome. Firstly, the most important question, tea or coffee? Mm, Rooibos tea or coffee? Can you fill us in on your background and your vision for the Green Building Council of South Africa? My biggest claim to fame, probably in the country, is that I drove the writing of energy efficiency standards for buildings. And I worked on the regulatory advisory group that um, did the regulation for energy efficiency in buildings. Um, I started the journey in sort of 2004 and only completed the end of 2011. So I have got the highest EQ of anybody that I know. So <laughs> it was a long term process. So along the way with um, doing the energy efficiency, obviously I got involved more in sort of just sustainability as a whole, not just um, not just energy. Um, we also worked on water standards. I worked on the energy performance certificate standards and um, the um, ISO 50001, it's an energy management system. So along my journey, I got more and more involved in the whole sustainability side. And in 2006, before the Green Building Council even started, um, I was approached by the founder members of, of um, or the founders of Green Building Council and asked me about energy efficiency because throughout the, the world is if you've got an energy efficiency standard or regulation, that is your conditional requirement to get even looked at to be an energy, um, to be a green building. And so obviously in South Africa, there was no energy efficiency standard. So you had to now put in what we call conditional requirements. And that's how I got involved in the Green Building Council is that I, was, I worked on many of the technical working groups um, doing rating tools, writing rating tools. And it just sort of developed from there and, and uh, served a, uh, on the board of the Green Building Council for a bit. And then uh, at, the, at that time I was in corporate. I sort of went out, did my own thing for a bit. And then obviously opportunity came around to, to head the Green Building Council. So I've always believed in what it stood for. And I think we, we need the Green Building Council to show us where we should be going, to show us what is possible in building. If I think, you know, I talk about 2006, 2007, the Green Building Council was actually formed. If I think of the, the whole environment at that time, we didn't, we didn't know as many concepts as we know now. We never spoke about rainwater harvesting. We never spoke about grey water harvesting. We never spoke that much about um, solar panels. And as this green building movement carried on, it brought the whole of South Africa with it, if, if, if that makes sense. It, um, so suddenly these terminologies were in our conversation and people were aware of it. And you found that, for instance, when um, Cape Town went through the major water restrictions, we know Eastern Cape went through drought, and Pope has gone through drought is suddenly we had solutions that we didn't know we had before. And even though we weren't sort of certifying these buildings as green, we were finding practical, real solutions that helped us with our water crisis. And I think if, if and that's the vision I see for the Green Building Council, is being that pathfinder, the leader, the, the, the guiding light of, of where we're going to go to. And it's not just about buildings, we've moved to precincts, we sort of talk about green precincts, you know, we always say that you can get a, a block in the middle of a, a city block filled of green buildings. It doesn't make it a green precinct. It just makes it a block of green buildings. And we want to sort of take that whole message further. And I think that's really the role that we, we play is, is, is sort of bringing or leading. It's not, it's not pulling, it's, it's leading the country sort of further. But saying that as well is also offering that kind of um, assistance and guidance, you know, even within the, the government, the national imperatives. We've signed the Paris Accord, you know, how do, does the country, you know, get the buildings, you know, 40% of the energy range between 35 to 40% of the greenhouse gases, you know, we can assist, again, leading to get to the low carbon future, to getting to net zero water and all those kind of things. How are you steering the Green Building Council 
in these troubled times. I do know that there's a lot of challenges that's being faced by the built environment. Also, what are some of these challenges and how are you looking to overcome them? It is huge challenges because obviously we, we are a member-based organization and you know we have to be showing our members that we are giving them value. You know, so this MVP, this member membership value proposition, it can't just be a slogan, it can't be um, an idea, it has to be something concrete, it has to be something that we're really, really offering them. Because again, when when you find a member and they're going to go, you know, do we pay the money here or do we pay it here? We must be offering them value. Um, one of the, the big pushes, obviously, is we're also looking at um, changing our education offering, our training offering, and putting it everything on online. I mean, and we know that is happening, um, but we want to make a difference. We want to make it interactive. We we widen it because we think, you know, if you look at it in this time is in, in, in my philosophy, you'll see it in, in, in many of our marketing messages is that South Africa has to recover from this. Why not make it a green recovery? Why go back to what we were doing before? Let's make it better. We've got the opportunity now. We have to put this effort, effort in to recover. Let's try and make it a green recovery. And with that, let's put some real skills into the market that can make this a green recovery. Because again, it makes business sense. You know, going green is not always about being aspirational. And, and you know, as I said, it is about leading, but it's also about, you know, if you save energy, you save costs. If you save water, you save costs. If you save energy and water, the risk of, of energy security or water security, it's it's minimized. And but people are saying, well, we love this idea, but how do we do it? And that's also where we want to, to guide. So I think what we've looked at, and, and obviously we, we, we had a huge sponsorship model at, at one time, that's a thing of the past. You know, I think we must not even consider that. So we're really looking at different programs. We're looking at what do we offer? What, what will make our members stick with us? What can we make a difference to, but practically and to say um, it's the green recovery. You know, often in, in Parliament, you hear about um, the green economy and the creation of green jobs, but it's, it's this concept, which is great, but let's be practical about it. Let's try and match this idea to this and, and, and create real employment. And as I say, let's recover in a, in a green manner. You know, the planet has recovered while we've been in lockdown. So, you know, and I'm not saying it's a great idea because we love the planet uh, recovering, but we need to recover now as well. You know, we, and, but what I'm saying is while we're recovering, let's not mess up the recovery that the planet's done. Let's try and do a hand in hand um, recovery together. So it's really about skills development. Um, what do we offer? And about looking at the buildings and saying, let's look at, practical guides to to making this this building more energy efficient more water efficient more resource efficient the other side of of the whole sort of covid scare and the pandemic scare is you know we always spoke about green buildings being healthier buildings health has now become tangible health before healthy buildings was almost an intangible you could measure it measure by productivity you could measure it by um uh, number of take, uh, days taken for sick leave. But now we're saying this is real to us. Healthy buildings are now real. Healthy air changes, healthy circulating HVAC to air. It must be clean. Surfaces, distances, spatial planning, all those things that were almost like sort of what are the, the benefits were almost intangible have become very tangible. And again, we're the right people to give that kind of guidance. We can say, guys, this is, you know, the green principles work for healthy buildings. Let's, um, let's use them and let us be your guide. And, and again, as I said, that is the role I see us playing, a, a sort of a, a, a practical role. So in the past, it seemed like the business case for green buildings wasn't quite understood or accepted. Do you feel that that has now changed? and that the business case is now fully understood? 
I wouldn't actually say that. I mean, I know I'm like, <laughs> I should, I'd mean, love to say yes, it is understood. I th and, but I think in a way it's also partly down to us is I don't think we've always demonstrated that it has. Um, where we do see the uh, benefit of it is, is in um, the return on investment. Um, MSCI do these um, program, uh, these, these researchers, and they found that a green certified building will give you a higher rate of, of return than a non-certified green building. So it's about, again, that, that um, it gives you that ease of mind, that if it's certified, then there's an independent third party who's actually said, yes, this building does what it's supposed to do. And I think it's, it's that sort of um, sense of, of uh, comfort and, and security that in, in people, you know, seeing that, yes, this, I have faith that I have confidence that this building will perform as it does. But I think we've got a lot more work to be to do to get that message through is that one, it's fine to have a good rate of, of return and rate of investment. But as I said, it's also what does it mean to you as a tenant? What does it mean to you as a building owner to have a green building? And it is, it's about a resource efficient, more cost efficient and healthier building. And I think those, those messages we haven't completely done properly. We haven't done it at great service and it's also part of the role that we must play. Because we've, we've got a set of, of people within this market who understand green buildings very well. But if, if, I mean, even if I speak to some friends of mine, you know, sitting around a braai, having some wine, that's my favorite beverage. And, uh, <laughs> and they start talking, because they know I'm in this green space, and they start talking to me. They really don't, they, they, they don't know. And it's not because they, you know, haven't bothered, they're just not in that space. And so they'll say to me, how do I do this? How do I, you know, how do I do grey water? Obviously in the middle of the, the crisis of the water crisis, I often got to ask my friends, what would you suggest for me to change in my house? To, you know, because it's not about being green, it's about really just not having water. So um, I think we, yeah, there's a huge role that we can play in, in educating the wider, the wider public. And talking about the green recovery, for, for you to reach that kind of objective, uh, you definitely need stakeholders to be on the same page. What challenges are you currently experiencing with regards to stakeholder collaboration and how do you suppose we fix that? Strangely enough, we don't, I'm not finding that much resistance with it because I think people are looking for, for solutions. The other thing about that I've found with this, this lockdown is people are more open to innovation. It's a very strange mindset. I found that our mindset has changed a lot because of the way we've had to deal with things. I mean, we're doing this, this meeting, but it's, I mean, Zoom meetings, Teams meeting, all that, they weren't commonplace. Now we do them like it's, you know, everyday occurrence. Well, it isn't everyday occurrence, so we just, we do them. And I've just found that people are, are more open to, to innovation because they see that the world is different and they want, to, they want to change. And I think it's more about the quest for how do we do it or what can we do as opposed to, I don't want to do that. If you spoke to me about the resistance to change pre-lockdown, it would have been a different conversation. I really think people are more open to innovation at the moment. You know, if you look at how people work, you know, they say that people, I think, I can't remember the number, but they were saying that quite a high percentage of people would want to go back to the office once, you know, everything's settled. But there's still that proportion of people saying, you know, I don't want to sit in traffic. I don't want to do this. I don't want to go back to that lifestyle. How do we make a dif difference? How do I get this best of both worlds thing? And I think if we can sort of do that hybrid, but I think people are open to those hybrid conversations. Is it, it it's... It won't be what we're doing now, but it's, and it won't, it probably won't be what we did before, but it's going to be this combination. So I think um, look, the, the questions are always show, show me, show me the savings, show me, prove to me that this is that. But I think that conversation will always be around. 
but it's and it's a good thing it's not a bad thing to be asked these things you have to be accountable you know if you're saying something if you're stating something you must be able to back it so i have i have no hassle with that but as i say i really believe this the time for innovation is also now if if um, and, and south africans i believe are very innovative and we should be looking at these opportunities and we should be saying hmm, how can we do this thing different because i think the time is now looking beyond the building what trends and opportunities do you currently see for south african and african cities arising from this COVID 19 pandemic it's this question of the green precincts as i said before a block of green buildings does make a green precinct and i think almost that the cities should be looking at again the cities as a whole and seeing how everything works together i mean a lot of cities overseas who go to to so much trouble just to synchronize traffic lights so that the traffic flows. I mean, I think sometimes in some of the cities we deliberately don't synchronize traffic lights to, to just stop. But, um, and, and I think it's all about that. It's, it's really sitting back and analyzing, you know, where things are from, how they go. You know, the, the probably the, again, the biggest challenge to cities, I think is not as much as energy, but as, as water. I think yeah, with, with water pollution of rivers and and dams and things like that, we should really, really be analyzing that and, and, and fixing that. So I think the, the biggest challenge to cities is actually, I think, take a bit of a step back and look at it holistically and say, okay, let's analyze where does our water come from? What does it go through? What stops it? Energy, how does this work? How do we get this traffic to flow? How do we reduce the carbon? green spaces, you know, let's, let's make meaningful green spaces. And in places where, you know, we, we start off, we make these gorgeous green spaces we, we children can play, you can go for walks and things like that. But again, without the care and the sort of uh, dedication to them, they end up as, as places that are dangerous to take your children, you know, because there's the, the, the wrong people are taking up those spaces. So I think, again, it's, it's really about saying, it's analyze this whole the city as a whole and how do we make it um, flow, have safe um, water, safe spaces for, for exercise for um, our children. Because that's the other thing is, who would have ever thought, maybe not Cape Town, Cape Town's not a good example, maybe Joburg is, is that people in Joburg don't tend to walk. But when they were locked down, now as soon as the restrictions were lifted, everybody's walking you know, because it's like i wasn't allowed to go outside and now i can you know so suddenly you know we, we're walking more we're going out more we you know we're doing the, we, we value exercise more and i think it's 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 really saying well let's take all these new things that we sort of got in our heads and let's make cities that reply to these questions that your people your citizens are asking to do let's look at that and and make it a, a whole green make green precincts do you think that people will start moving out of the cities uh, into the suburbs because there's a lot of green spaces there do you think suburbs or smaller local municipalities will start to rejuvenate themselves Look, I hope so. I mean, I mean that's the, the, the hope, and I think it, it, it would. But um, I, I, still, I still do hold out for, for cities to do the, the same thing, the inside the CBDs. Um, you know, the suburbs are, are, are probably an easier win. You know, the, in the suburbs, a lot of suburbs do the right thing. But again, as I say, tackle it precinct by precinct. But yeah, the, the suburbs will be always a place for people. But, I mean, if you think of it, um, for instance, what do I love most about, say, walking in, in, in a place in France, walking in a place in, in Germany, is that I can walk at any time. Um, you know, you have the sort of whole restaurants falling out onto the pavement. Cape, Cape Town's got a bit of that. And some places in Joburg, is, you know, where you've got that sort of social space and social. But it's all about 
living near where you work, but being able then to walk to work, being able to walk to your shop, walk to your restaurant, you know, that. So, so again, cities are, are, are ideally uh, built for non-traffic. You know, it, it's, it's, and if we could get that sort of sense of space, security, that you can just walk whenever, that would be, you know, the first prize. And as I say, yeah, suburbs are always good for, for green spaces. And I think, you know, the thing that cities must try and avoid is not always possible. Is they say that um, if you in, in a very high-rise building, if you can't get the see the street or get that sense of community, you actually feel very, very cut off from the rest of society. And it's about being able to see people in the street, be able to feel that sense of community. That's also very important. We need that, that sense of community. So if I gave you a magic wand and I told you you could change one piece of legislation affecting your sector, what would that legislation be and why? Wow. <laughs> I'm not going to, I know I'm going to talk across women and say, do I only get one? <laughs> <laughs> I can't say, can I wish for 100? No. Um, sure. Maybe not to look at the Green Star rating, but to take the fundamentals of green buildings, green living, and make that the norm. But for all. Because again, the, and I'll use an example, when we write energy efficiency standards, we always have to remember affordable housing because you can't go too far ahead and not bring you can't leave a piece of the society behind you can't leave a piece of our community behind so when we up energy efficiency we have to make sure that everybody benefits from it and we all go along and sometimes it's a bit of a drag so what i would i would love if i had a magic wand i would say you know these are these great minimum standards for all that is not about high-rise, big corporate buildings being at a certain green standard. It's also about this affordable housing sector, not being affordable housing anymore, but being affordable homes side, you know, having these, these healthy places. And so my magic wand would make minimum standards for all, right, but up there. So what advice do you have for women in the built environment uh, sector, especially in these difficult times? Uh, and how do you propose we set ourselves up for the future? Well, I've always said that um, the green space is a great place for women. Um, because again, it's an innovative space, not just in innovative um, equipment or you know, sort of gadgets. It's also innovative in, in solutions and in what you can do with solutions and innovative in how flexible your time is. Um, we, we did a survey quite a while ago and a colleague of mine, she graduated with uh, 25 female engineers out of a, probably a huge, much huger class. And five years later, only six of them were still practicing engineers and the others had moved to like other fields. And again, it's because that, and I'm not just talking about female engineers, but it's just an example where they've sort of come into the space where it, it just doesn't really, it's not conducive to, you know, you, you're going to, on certain sites, there's not even lose there, you know, it's, it's a crazy time. But as soon as, as, as women have children, then they need the flexibility, then there's not always that. And I think the screen space is, is good for, for that. Is, is, it's, it's about um, one, you know, changing things, being innovative, but I think it's also it's ideal for, for, for um, small companies, women-led companies. I think it's, it's, it's really, there's, there's a lot of aspects that we can tackle and we can create solutions within, within companies. So I think, um, just so you know, one fifth of my staff are men. So, <laughs> <I've>, <laughs> and sometimes they, they're like, oh, you know, <laughs> surrounded by ladies. But <laughs> so it's a bit different. So, um, 
in my space, <laughs> we're definitely female dominated. <laughs> um, and yeah, mix, yeah, mixed races, mixed, but as I say, predominantly female and, and a few men. Um, so I think this is the right, you know, really it's the right space for women. But I think, again, in the broader um, energy efficiency, water efficiency space, I think there's really a lot of opportunity for women to get involved in, in the sort of, um, and especially in the, in the retrofit space, because again, if we look at, you know, when I spoke about the green recovery and I didn't go into a lot of detail, because again, we've got a lot of existing buildings. We've got a lot of things that are not energy efficient, they're not water efficient. So there's huge opportunities to retrofit them into, um, into a more sustainable shape. And that retrofitting offers a lot of opportunities for all, whether it be um, engineers who model it to uh, people who install it, who actually um, build and, and retrofit those buildings. So the sort of whole green job space is a lot of it in, in the retrofit space. And again, a lot of opportunities. And, you know, and I say just the soft skills, but I mean, I also I've, I've spoken to women in construction, hardworking ladies who really, really put the muscle and the sweat behind, behind everything. So I think it's just about opening the doors and opening opportunities. The Green Building Convention is going digital this year. It's very exciting. Yes. Can you expand a bit on the theme of the convention this year and attendees? How will they be looking forward to networking and doing business? Yeah. I love the new convention. And, and I must just say, I always say that I'm BBC. I'm born before computers. So it has to be easy for me to do it, okay? Don't ask me to do like any video game. Useless at it. But what I love about this <laughs> is it's really easy, <laughs> but you, you, you know the program. So it's not, it's what I, I do love, it's, it's not death by webinar, but if you want to do death by webinar, you're welcome to choose that option. So I'm not saying don't do it, but it is, um, it's a fully immersive so, uh, program. So you can create your own avatar, so you can look like you or you can look like somebody else. But as, and then you walk through an, a virtual exhibition and you actually visit. And what I love is, is, is that, so if you were walking in real life and if you're walking in this computer side, in this virtual convention, as you walk and, and somebody walks past you, their names are above the avatar and you can talk to them. You know, you can engage in conversation or you just walk past. As you go onto the exhibit, exhibition stands, you engage. You'll see the, the, the choices, you know, you can click on to get brochures. You know, you can have a conversation with the person staffing that stand. Um, you can see their name. And as you walk onto the stand, um, the exhibitors will get all that information of that person who's interested. And it's there, it's online, it's, it's really, you know, they don't have to write down, take names, take cards. They can they actually, you know, it's, it's registered straight away. What we want to do is, is have everybody walk through the exhibition hall going into the plenary session. You can find your seat, sit down, and then watch the, the, the plenary session, listen to the speakers. Um, you can set up time. So if you see who's online, you can um, ask them to, to network at any time. You can set a time with them to have an, a conversation, as you would if you were there in real life. Um, you can set a time to talk to me if you want to, and <laughs> we can chat. So it's, it's um, and then there'll be, you know, the same, there's tracks and, and there's a um, lot of, of, of opportunities uh, to, to be exposed to a lot of different subjects. Great speakers. Um, what's gorgeous as well is that we've got speakers from all over the world. They're not traveling anywhere, you know, so the, the whole thing is while the world is recovering, we, we're bringing the convention in the clouds. And it's, it's also part of that whole recovery is that we, we're, you know, nobody's flying anywhere. Nobody's staying anywhere. Nobody's driving anywhere. You just, you arrive in your computer, but you don't want to, as I said, not have that networking opportunity. A lot of people come to conventions more for the networking than for the speakers. So there's, there, is, there are great speakers, but if you want that networking, this is an ideal platform. So, so for anybody who's played Sims and you, you know, can <laughs> create your own space, walk around, be your, your, you know, 
be your personality, you, you, it's there. And the great thing about this is you'll have introverts actually taking part this time in the networking yes. activity yes. as well. It's an introvert I didn't, I didn't think of that. You're right. All the little computer introverts. <laughs> That's a very good point. Do you have any um, parting words of advice for the built environment sector and the green building sector? Don't be too pessimistic, you know. You have to be a bit pragmatic, be, you know, because it's going to be tough. But I think it's doable, and, it, and I think the opportunity is here, as I say, for to recover green. I think it's just embrace the possibilities, and, and, and we, we have to go for it. We, you know, we, we are a, a nation that goes for it. I think that we survive. We might moan about it a lot on the journey, but we will get there. Um, and I think if it's if it's anything, just just know that it's doable, and let's in and let's recover in in a green manner. Let's let's do the green recovery. And I would just say, don't think any that all is lost. It really isn't.